Are you ready for our next comic? Yeah. She's been with us a couple of times. If you have any questions for her after the show, she can help you out. Okay? So please welcome to the stage, Dr. Bob. up because you know when you get to my age it's not Alzheimer's but I call it old timers. This helps me remember why I came in the room. <laughs> so I am a retired podiatrist and during my career I've had some interesting things happen and uh, I was invited to a very formal bar mitzvah and my husband was out of town so I was seated at the other's table with a bunch of women and we sit down and this was a very fancy affair with you know, crystal and china and silver and linen and some fancy centerpieces. We sit down and this lady next to me says, hi, I'm Nancy, I'm a teacher. So I said, hi, I'm Bonnie, I'm a podiatrist. And then this lady over here says, hi, I'm Margaret, I'm in PR. And I go, oh, PR, that's kind of interesting. What exactly do you do when you're in PR? So we're chatting for a minute. I turn back and there's a naked foot on the table, next to my fork and napkin. And yeah, she had a hunk of bunion going on there. But I, I was so taken aback that all I could think to say was, I'm glad I'm not a proctologist. <laughs> I was in my office and my assistant comes over and says to me, Dr. Bonnie, I have a new patient in room number two. Here's the chart. And then she rolls her eyes. So already I'm getting a little nervous. So I go into the room, and there's a very uh, well-dressed woman sitting in the chair, and uh, we start talking, and she tells me she's a social worker, and uh, that she was sent here on referral from her internist, who I knew. And uh, so I start talking with her, and I said, well, you know, what can I help you with? What's, what's bothering you with your feet? So she says, well, one of my feet thinks it's a cat. And the other one thinks it's a dog, and they keep chasing each other, and I'm tripping over them. I said, really? I said, and, and, and how do you know which one's the dog? She said, oh, the left one's the dog, because it keeps barking and waking me up at 7 o'clock in the morning to take it out. And the right one's the cat, because it keeps scratching the other leg, and I keep finding hairballs between the toes. Okay. And what are these unusual ankle bracelets you're wearing? Oh, those are flea collars because they do sleep in bed with me. <laughs> so I'm kind of getting a picture here. And uh, I said, well, I, I think that you can be helped, but I think you may be in the wrong office. So I'm going to send you to somebody who can help you. So I referred her to a veterinarian. <laughs> Doctor. She happens to be in the audience tonight with her husband. And, uh, and she was going off to medical school at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, kind of far away. I asked her, do you know what kind of doctor you want to be? And she says, well, I'm not really sure yet. I said, well, why don't you be something I can use, like a plastic surgeon or a diet doctor, you know, something good. She says, well, we'll see. Flash forward three and a half years, she calls me and says, Mom, I figured out what kind of doctor I'm going to be, and it's something you can use. I said, really? What's that? She says, a psychiatrist. <laughs> she says, as a matter of fact, I'm on the psych floor right now. I love nutty people. Bernie, get out of that linen cart. You can't sneak out of here. <laughs> and by the way, I've been dating somebody, and it's getting serious. I said, oh, I said, that's great. What specialty, what specialty is he? Oh, he's not a doctor. Well, what is he, like a lawyer or a research PhD? No. So let me preface this, that when Jewish mothers are teaching their daughters what to look for in a husband, one of the most important concepts that they have to understand is that size matters. <laughs> and I'm talking about the paycheck. I said, well, well, what exactly does he do? He 
He's a stand-up comedian. I go, 3,000 doctors at Mayo Clinic, and you're gonna marry a clown? Oh my God. And the wedding was a circus. Now, this is not the first uh, lessons I've taken. Uh, years ago, I talked my neighbor into taking Chinese cooking lessons with me. And the way this worked was, it was kind of a bar-like affair, and the lady with the wok was behind the bar, and was sitting with there with the recipes, and she's doing the lessons, and my neighbor's sitting next to me, and over here is a very attractive young woman, except for one thing. She has a horrible thing on her lip. I mean, this is like looking at somebody who has two noses, and you can't take your eyes off it. It was like a big black thing here, and I'm thinking to myself, why the hell didn't she get that removed? I mean, you know. So we go through the six weeks of lessons, and every time I'm talking to her, I'm looking at this thing, and I know it's shallow, but I, I couldn't take my eyes off this thing. Like, oh, why the hell did she have that removed? Yeah. So we get to the end of the six weeks of lessons, and she says to us, oh, I had such a good time with you ladies. Tell me, what do you do, and what do your husbands do? So my neighbor says, well, I'm a, a teacher and my husband's an attorney. And I said, well, I'm a podiatrist and my husband's a scientist. And she says, well, I'm at home with my two young children and my husband's a plastic surgeon. <laughs> now I feel a claw on my thigh from my neighbor digging into my flesh. And I said, your husband's a plastic surgeon? And she says, yes, and can you believe that when I go to conferences with him, his colleagues come up and say, you know, I can remove that for you. Now the floor is getting tighter. And I said, well, yeah, I could believe that. Why didn't you do it? She says, I'm afraid it'll leave a scar. And now the floor is to the bone. Let me tell you, any scar would be 99% less acreage than this thing. All it was missing was a hair coming out of it. Flash forward about 30 years, my friend calls me up and says, I saw her in the grocery store today and said hello. She's getting, she got divorced. So she got rid of the plastic surgeon, but she still has the thing on her lip. When you get to my age, I call it the fat and funeral stage. This is what comes after you've had grandchildren and so on. And when I say the fat and funeral stage, so all the women that I've known, most of them, that were size, you know, four, six, and eight, are now size 14, 16, and 18. <laughs> and not too happy about it. And all the men that I knew, their chest dropped down to their waist. I haven't been fat my whole life and not too perturbed about this. I'm kind of used to it. But the one thing I do resent is I still get the fat lecture when I go to the doctors. What do I mean by that? When you're fat and you go to the doctor, no matter what's wrong with you, no matter why you're there, it's somehow related to the fact that you're too fat. <laughs> you can go into the emergency room with a gunshot wound, died about three years ago. He lived down in Florida by himself. He was divorced three times. And I used to call him on Sundays and Thursdays. So I called him on a Sunday, we chatted, and then I called him the next Thursday and there was no answer. But that was not unusual because sometimes he left the cell phone in a different room and he'd always get back to me. But he did not do that this time. So I called to have a check done on him. And the detective calls me and he says, well, I'm sorry to say, but from the evidence we found in the house, it looks like what happened was that your brother took his Monday, uh, Monday lunchtime meds, we can tell from his pillbox, and then from the papers and bag on the table there, it looks like he ate a couple of chili dogs and laid down to take a nap, and he passed away from natural causes in his sleep. 
And we removed the body to the coroners, because that's what we do here. But I would suggest you get down to your ASAP. Now, when someone says to you that somebody died of natural causes in their sleep, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking like Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> My husband and I fly down there, we walk in the house, and the first thing that hits us is the smell, which is to be expected. I mean, he died on a, on a Monday, they didn't find him until Saturday, so things could get pretty dicey in Florida, like with no air conditioning for almost a week. Then I get ready to go in the bedroom. Now, at this point, I had been in medicine for almost 50 years. And when you're in medicine, you see a lot and you hear a lot, but nothing could have, nothing could have prepared me for what I was about to experience. I walk into the bedroom and it looks like somebody was axe murdered. There is blood on the walls, on the bed, on the floor. There's tissue hanging off the lamp, and I'm not talking Kleenex. I called the detective and I said, I thought you said he died of natural causes. This looks like a, like a horror scene here. Well, I left out the part that he exploded. <laughs> what do you mean he exploded? You mean like the Hindenburg? He says, I'm afraid so. What are you talking about? Well, actually, this happens in Florida quite frequently. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, depending on what folks ate before they passed away, gas can build up and they can explode. I told him to lay off the chili dogs, right? Didn't expect this. He says, however, the good news in this is because this happens so often in Florida, homeowners insurance covers the hazmat cleanup that's required. He says, actually, the good news in all of this is that he left me everything. Or one last thing, my youngest daughter, who is also in the audience tonight. Yeah. When she entered high school, she informed me that she wanted to wrestle. Now, I've got to tell you, Jews don't wrestle. <laughs> and Jewish girls, for sure, don't wrestle. So I said, well, why don't you talk to the coach about that? So she goes to the old coach in the high school and tells him she wants to wrestle. And he tells her, over my dead body, a girl's gonna wrestle with boys. So she comes back and tells me this, and I'm thinking, oh, that's too bad. But really, I'm thinking, great. Two weeks later in the school, they make an announcement, old coach so-and-so has left us, which she interpreted as meaning he died, and we have a new coach in this wrestling tryouts. So she comes home and says to me, Mom, will you go with me to the wrestling tryouts? I go, all right, I'll go with you. So we go to this gymnasium filled with boys, with mostly their fathers, and me and her. She's the only girl who's gonna do this. So the coach chats with her for a minute, and he comes over to me and he says, you know, she's not very physically fit. What are you expecting, a scholarship to college and wrestling? I said, what am I expecting? I'm expecting when you tell Porky over there to run around the track, you'll never see her again. That's what I'm expecting. Flash forward senior year of high school. Captain of the Varsity Boys wrestling team. All American, top five in the country. U.S. Women's Olympic wrestling team recruit. Wrestling. Ultra applause, the school was in North Dakota. <laughs> Meanwhile, during this time, she comes to me and says, Mom, I want to get a tattoo because all the boys on the team have tattoos. And I'm thinking, Jews don't wrestle and Jews don't get tattoos. <laughs> so I didn't say anything, she didn't say anything, she didn't ask me for any money, so I figured maybe she forgot it. Two months later, she says to me, Mom, you want to see my tattoo? Now, when I think of a tattoo on girls, I think about something about this big, like a flower or a fairy or something like that. She pulls up her skirt, and there is a tattoo from her groin to her knee of a life-size rooster. <laughs> and now I'm the only 
only mother in America who wishes the door to open for the tram stamp. And I said, why on earth would you get something like that? She says, because now I have the biggest cop on the team.